أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God the compassionate, the merciful the one who has created everything in utmost perfection and may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and his immaculate progeny of Ahlul Bayt, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. Allahumma salli ala. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً صدق الله العلي العظيم Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد One of the major concerns or problems of our modern day society is that marriage is no longer treated with sanctity, with full respect. Marriage has become more of a game. Many people treat marriage like their clothes. They put them on when they want, and when they don't feel like it, they just take off their clothes. They're not dealing with marriage seriously. We see that the popular culture does not treat this important institution with full respect. In the religion of Islam, the institution of marriage is one of the most important institutions in our society. If it's a healthy institution, our society will be a healthy society. If it's not a healthy institution, it's suffering, it's failing, our society collectively will also fail. That's why the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, in one hadith, he states, مَا بُنِيَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ بِنَاءٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَعَزُّ مِنَ التَّزْوِيجِ the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, no institution in the religion of Islam has been built which is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more dear to God than the institution of marriage. This institution safeguards my life. It allows me to function properly in society. Marriage offers many benefits. A study that was conducted by the New York Times in the 90s lists some of these wonderful benefits that marriage will offer every human being. The first benefit, contrary to what you might think, is that married people on average are financially more well off than single people. Their income is higher. We're not talking about the combined income of the husband and the wife. We're looking at the individual income. On average, it tends to be higher. You know, we're surprised sometimes when we read verses in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us in the Holy Quran that if you are married and you don't have anything, you're poor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that He will improve your financial situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you more than if you are single. This is a promise in the Holy Quran. Many people don't believe in these statements of the Holy Quran. We claim to be Muslims who accept the Quran, but practically, we don't implement the teachings of the Quran. You see a young man, you ask him, why don't you get married? Oh, I don't have the money. That means you don't believe in these statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is saying, in yakunu fuqara yughnihumullahu min fadlih, you say no, I have to be financially well off in order for me to get married. So indirectly I am rejecting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have problems in society and then we complain. 
Here we have a study performed by scientists, by psychologists, by sociologists, that is telling us that married people are financially more well off than people who are not married. You know, they say one day this woman was talking with her friends and they were speaking about their financial status. So the, the woman, she said, my wife, I, I, he, she said, my husband, I made my husband into a millionaire. So her friends, they're excited to learn how. How is it that her, she made her husband a millionaire? So they ask her, tell us, what's your secret? She says, well, before we got married, he was a billionaire. Now he's a millionaire. <laughs> Believe it or not, once you get married, true, you will end up spending more. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you more. They say one day this guy, his credit card was stolen. So he was with his friends. They told him, aren't you going to call the credit card company? I mean, it's been a week. Your credit card has been stolen. Aren't you going to report this? He says, no. They tell him why. He's like, the thief spends less than my wife does. So let him keep my credit card. <laughs> we human beings, once we enter this institution, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us. Look at the facts in our society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us to increase the blessings on us. Let's have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This requires faith. This requires trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second benefit, as this study explains, is that people who are married, generally speaking, they have lower rates of depression, lower rates of suicide, and lower rates of alcohol abuse. It makes a human being responsible. It makes a human being stable. Marriage gives you a sense of responsibility. And these days, in our society, we really need that responsibility. I need to feel responsible. Many of our youth, they're irresponsible with their activities, with their time, with some of the things that they do. Marriage gives us responsibility. We can't party, you know, like we were able to when we were single. Because now you have a family to support. You have kids, you have a wife who are waiting for you at home. You can't spend your time partying and wasting time. And most of our youth do waste their time. Once you marry, this instills in you a sense of responsibility. The third benefit that marriage gives you is that it gives you a longer life. According to scientific studies, married men live longer than single people. Married women live longer than single women. Now, by the way, maybe married people are more willing to die than the average person, but they do live longer than the average person. The fourth benefit is that marriage increases your happiness. Scientifically, this has been proven. This has been demonstrated. You know, in, in, in a time of age where depression and unhappiness is spreading in our society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us an institution where we can find true happiness in. Yes, there are complications, absolutely. We have been created in this life to be tested. So there will be difficulties, there will be complications. But at the end of the day, look at the facts. Married people are happier than people who are not married. They say once, you know, a man was speaking to a group of his friends and so they asked him about his life and his happiness. He says, yes, my wife and I were perfectly happy for 20 years and then we met each other. But marriage does really give you happiness. This has been scientifically proven. Another benefit that we find in marriage is that it gives us psychological stability. And the overall state of our mental well-being becomes better. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us in the Holy Quran through the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's best for us. You know, people who cohabit, you know, they live together but they're not married. Since the 1970s, this has increased 500%. Now, according to these studies, Cohabitation does not give you the full benefits of marriage. A person can be living, you know, with a partner for 20 years. 
But if they're not married, they're just cohabitating with each other, they don't receive the full benefits of marriage. Because when you're not married, that level of commitment is not there. These people, next morning, they could part their ways. You can say bye to her and leave. There is no commitment. There is no strong sense of commitment. We find the strong sense of commitment in a marriage, a marriage that is healthy. Now, the society as a whole is really suffering from this problem with marriage. You know, the divorce rate is over 50% in, in most of our societies. And it's increasing. Even in many Muslim countries, it's increasing. 30, 40, 50%. Many youth wonder, many people wonder, how is it that I can start a healthy marriage? What is the key to a prosperous, successful marriage? Now the secret to a successful marriage remains a secret, brothers and sisters. However, if we pay attention to the Holy Quran, and if we pay attention to the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, there are some steps that we can take in order for us to secure a successful marriage by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing that we need to keep in mind, especially the youth, there are many reasons, you know, why you would want to get married. We just mentioned some of the benefits. And it is perfectly okay for someone to think or consider marriage to achieve these benefits. However, the first step towards a successful marriage, a healthy marriage, is that when you begin to think of marriage, make your intention and your incentive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tell yourself, the reason why I want to marry, yes, I will receive these benefits, and I'm aware of these benefits of marriage, but the reason why I want to marry is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed me to get married. Make your incentive Allah. Because the problem is when you get married for certain benefits, the problem is one day might come, five years later, ten years later, and you're no longer receiving that benefit from marriage. In that case, this will increase the likelihood of you getting divorced. Because you're no longer receiving that benefit. You will tell yourself, wait a minute, I got married for these benefits, one, two, three, and I'm no longer receiving them in marriage the way I thought I would. That encourages you to end this relationship. But if you marry for a valid reason, for a noble reason, and that's to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always there. Ten years later, even if you have problems, you're suffering in your marriage, you will tell yourself, I did not marry for these specific reasons. I married for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there, I continue to obey Him, I will continue this marriage. This will solidify my commitment in the marriage. So keep that in your mind, brothers and sisters. The first step towards a successful marriage is to make the transaction, before you make that transaction with your wife, make that transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then bless your marriage. And you will always find the commitment and the motivation to continue, even if there are problems. But for the well-being of your family, for the well-being of your children, you will continue to sacrifice. The second step towards a successful marriage is that you allow the true love that Allah has created amongst us to set in after you get married, not before you get married. This is not what our society teaches us. Our society teaches us that, you know, you need to get married before you need, to, you need to find in love, you need to fall in love before you get married. This is an incorrect misconception that most people have. Let the love set in after marriage, not before marriage. Because the love that a human being experiences before marriage, yes, you know, it seems like it's a wonderful experience, but this can end up doing more damage to you and your future than it gives you benefit. Because people, when they 
fall in love with someone, they become blind to the faults of that person. You need to know with whom you're marrying. You need to know with whose character you're marrying. What is the personality of this person? When you fall in love with someone, you cannot see the true face of that person. We become actors, right? When you fall in love with someone, you start acting. You don't show your true self. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that He will allow the love to take place. Allah has made you compassionate towards each other. But this is after you have achieved marriage. Our society is suffering, brothers and sisters, because they teach our kids, they teach the youth that you need to go get to know a person for six months, for two years, fall in love. And then once you're completely in love, then think about marriage. This is wrong. This has detrimental consequences. Let me give you an example. A doctor, a surgeon who wants to practice surgery, how do they do that? They study for 10 years, 12 years, they experiment in the lab, and then they actually operate on a human being. They perform an operation, they conduct surgery. Now imagine if a person comes and he says, you know what, I don't want to go through that path. I don't want to do all that research and, 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 and study for 10, 12 years. Just bring me a human and I'll try, I'll experiment on their body. And inshallah, after five, ten years, I'll eventually get the hang of it. You may get the hang of it eventually, but after killing 10, 20 people, right? That's not how it goes. In the religion of Islam, first do research about your partner, about their qualities, about their religion, about their character. Do the research once you found the right person, then fall in love with that person. Don't fall in love first and then try to discover what their personality is. Try to discover if this is the right person for me or not. Because when you fall in love, love blinds you. You cannot see the reality. You know, they say one day a husband got into an argument with his wife. So he told her, you know what? I was a complete fool when I married you. She says, yes, dear, I know. But I was blind to see it when I was in love with you. I couldn't realize that you were a fool. The, the problem that exists in our society and, and what the media, you know, what popular culture, what the movies teach our children is that you need to find, in, you need to you fall in love and then find the appropriate person. This does damage to us brothers and sisters. And one day we'll regret it. You know, when that chemistry starts disappearing, and you live with that person, you begin to see a very different side. A side you had never seen. First, do the appropriate research and then fall in love with that person. The best advice that I can give you if you're trying to find the appropriate person is if you think there is someone suitable for you in your community, in your society, Approach the friends of that person. See, you don't need to know someone for six months, for a year. You don't need to go out with someone in order to realize what kind of personality they have. Approach their friends and ask their friends about this person. Because our friends know everything about us. If I'm a selfish person and I'm in love with someone, I'm not going to show that side of me, right? But my friends know if I'm a selfish person. If I'm a good person, my friend knows that. If I'm an angry person, my friends know that. They've been with me. They can tell you exactly what kind of a personality I have. So if you really want to do the appropriate research, either you directly go to their friends or have someone. Have your brother, have your cousin, have your friend go to their friends. And in the religion of Islam, this is one of those, this is, you know, one of those exceptions in which you are allowed to share information with someone. If someone comes to you and asks you, tell me about your friend. Does he have negative qualities? Because I want to marry this person. I'm interested in marrying this person. Ask the friends, brothers and sisters. The friends will tell you. And remind them that Islamically, they are obligated to tell you. They can't hide the truth from you. And this is not ghibah, this is not backbiting. This is advice that is accepted in the religion of Islam. 
go to their friends and the friends will give you a better idea of what this person is. Once you've done your research, you've realized that this person has the qualities, then seriously consider marriage and whether you want this person or not. This way, brothers and sisters, you will be securing your own future. You will be avoiding so much headache, so much headache. Many people don't know what they're getting themselves into. They really don't know that person. The way for you to truly find out that person, contact friends and some family members. But the friends, they know us better. Believe me, friends know us better than our parents. Because we act differently when, when, when we are with our friends than, we, than when we're at home with our parents or even with our brothers and sisters. The friends can give you a very accurate description of what this person is like. So this is the second step towards a successful marriage. The third step, as the Prophet, peace be upon him, teaches us, focus on two qualities only. Yes, there are many qualities. You want this person to be compatible with you, to have the same mode of thinking. There are many qualities that we all have, many preferences. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, says the most important two qualities are these. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهْ فَزَوَّجُهُ If someone comes, approaches you, asks your hand in marriage, if this person is religious, number one. Secondly, this person has good character. This person has good akhlaq. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, زَوَّجُهُ Marry this person. Then the Prophet gives us a word of warning. If you don't. What happens if we don't take this advice? If you don't do this, corruption will spread in your society and a huge fitna will occur in your society. And this is exactly what we're seeing around the globe. If someone approaches you and this person has these two qualities, that's a great sign. You can explore the other qualities as well. But if a person comes to you and he fits all of your you know, qualifications, all of your expectations, but does not have the religion or the akhlaq, do not ever think of marrying such a person. A person who is religious, a person who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not oppress you. you. This person will respect you. A person who respects God will respect you. A person who has no respect for the laws of God may not respect you. You're safe with a person who is religious, a person who is mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person will respect your rights. Make sure that this person is truly religious. Just because this person, you see him, you know, coming to the mosque and praying, that doesn't mean this person's religious. Again, ask his friends. Go to his friends. When you went out with this person, you went on vacation together. Is this person a religious person? Is this person a person who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's how you realize if someone's religious or not. You have to back, go back to their friends. My friends know whether I'm a religious person or not. So don't, you know, be deceived by the appearance of someone. Go and do the appropriate research. And secondly, make sure this person has the proper akhlaq, the proper character. Because you're not marrying this person's looks or this person's body. You're marrying this person's akhlaq. It is the akhlaq that you have to deal with every single day, brothers and sisters. You know, that's why the beautiful statement says that if you fall in love with the akhlaq of someone, with the spirit of someone, you can only truly love one person. But if you fall in love with the body of someone, then the entire world cannot satisfy you. If a man falls in love with the body of a woman, all the females of the world cannot satisfy this man. But if this man falls in love with the akhlaq of a woman, if she falls in love with his character, then this will satisfy this person. This person will be completely satisfied with his life. So look for the appropriate akhlaq. 
Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, this amazing man, when he speaks about his relationship with Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, he says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا أَغْضَبْتُهَا وَلَا أَغْضَبَتْنِي He says, I swear by God, never did I anger my wife one day, neither did she anger me once in her life. And then the Imam salam, says, whenever I used to look at the face of Fatima, all of, my, all of my miseries, my depression, my sadness would go away. This is the type of person whom we need to look for. A person, you know, when you come back from work, you're exhausted, you're tired. A simple look at this person, at the akhlaq of this person, at the gentleness of this person will cause you to forget your misery. You know, one day, a, a psychologist writes this. He says, one day a woman who was suffering in her marriage, you know, their marriage was suffering, goes to a psychologist. She tells him, I have issues with my husband. What advice can you give me? So he asks a few questions. He realizes what the problem is. He says, I ask you to do one thing only. Just one thing. If you promise me to do it, I assure you that your marriage will improve. He tells her today, today, starting tonight or tomorrow, when you go home, all you need to do with your husband is smile more often. Just give him the biggest smile you can. She tells him, come on, I'm not kidding. I mean, I'm, I'm paying you for these services. I want real advice. He says, no, this is real advice. You try it. If it doesn't work, I'll give you your money back. She says the next morning, you know, she was preparing breakfast. Her husband came down and the minute she saw him, you know, she greeted him with this big smile. The husband, you know, he was kind of shocked. This is the first time he sees his wife smiling like that in the morning. So he also begins to smile, but he's not sure what's going on. He has his breakfast. He goes to work. He comes back from work. You know, when she sees his car pulling up into the driveway, into the garage, she opens the garage door and she greets him with a bigger smile. At that point, the man starts laughing. The man starts laughing, he smiles back. Two weeks later, she goes back to the psychologist. She tells him, sir, this smile that she told me about changed my marriage 180 degrees. One smile. Before, we weren't even talking with each other. You know, it had been months and years since we had smiled like that in each other's faces. You want someone who pays attention to his akhlaq. And that's the best way for you to secure a prosperous marriage. One of the things that we also should keep in mind, brothers and sisters, when we are, you know, in a marriage or considering a marriage, is always, and this is very difficult, but if we train ourselves to be at this level, most of our problems will be resolved. Train yourself to have low expectations. What destroys our marriages is high expectations. When I have high expectations from my wife, I expect her to do this and to do that and to say this and to do that, we have problems. Always lower your expectations. In fact, we have a hadith from the Imam salam. You know, as believers, we're never allowed to act stupid, right? Never. As believers, we have to be respectful, have to be wise and smart and intelligent at all the time. There is only one exception. Where is that exception? The Imam salam says, in our marriages, the Imam salam says, At-Taghabi, At-Taghabi, it's from Ghaba. A taghabi is recommended. In our marriages, sometimes acting stupid is perfect. If your spouse says something to you, right? She attacks you verbally. Act as if you did not even hear it. Just act stupid. Act if you did not understand what that statement meant. This is the only exception that we have. Because if you want to respond to everything that is said and every attack that's against you, you will not solve the problem. You will simply complicate the problem. Act as if you didn't hear it. Doesn't matter. Train yourself. This is also a good, you know, lesson that you can teach to your spouse. When, when he or she realizes that you, you know, just did, did not respond back, in the long term, 
this person's attitude will also change. So let's keep that in mind, brothers and sisters, that the akhlaq and the religion of a person is the best key to success. If you find someone with these qualities, if you believe that someone has, you know, uh, uh, some of these qualities, then you can consider marrying this person. Otherwise, don't be deceived by something else. By the position of this person, by the beauty of this person, by the wealth of this person, none of that can buy you happiness. Only the akhlaq of a person, the character of a person, the religion of a person can assure you happiness. So this is the third step that we must take towards a successful marriage. The fourth step, brothers and sisters, and this is very important, especially in our society these days, is the age of marriage. Our society keeps delaying and delaying and delaying the age of marriage. And this is having severe consequences, brothers and sisters. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, مَا مِنْ شَابٍ تَزَوَّجَ فِي حَدَاثَةِ سِنِّهِ إِلَّا عَجَّ شَيْطَانٌ the Prophet says when, you know, a young man or a young woman marries at an early age, their shaitan will start screaming, yelling, crying. What does he say? Ya wayla hu ya wayla. Woe unto him. Woe unto him. Laqad asamani min deen. He has protected two-thirds of his religion from me. Before marriage was wide open. Now after marriage, two-thirds of his religion has been protected. Now the shaitan is blocked. You deny him access to two-thirds of your religion. Then the Prophet says, فَلْيَبْتَقِ اللَّهَ الْعَبْدُ فَالثُرُثِ الْآخِرِ The Prophet says, now you have only one-third to take care of. Have taqwa, piety in one-third of your religion. Of course, this is figurative. This is a figure of speech, symbolic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that if we get married for the right reasons, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect our faith for us. Why is it that we delay marriage when we are achieving many of these benefits? You know, one of the misconceptions that we have is that, well, I need to be stable. I need to be, you know, uh, uh, stable in my career. I should have finished my studies. And then once I'm stable, I can think of getting married. You know what the problem is with this mode of thinking, with this mentality? Is that a successful marriage, not a marriage that will end in divorce after five years, ten years. We're talking about a healthy, successful marriage. A successful marriage is one that is based on a history of mutual sacrifice. When you're young, yes, you're busy. You're trying to achieve your education. You're trying to make a living. But when you get married at that age, let's say 20, 22, now you are sacrificing one another. It is the sacrifice, brothers and sisters, that will keep a strong bond between you. When you become 30 and you're established and you have your own career and you're making a living and you have a house, you don't know that person. You don't have a history of sacrifice with that person. Tomorrow you get into an argument, you don't like it, she will go her way, you will go your way. You don't really care about this person. Because now that you settled and everything is going easy, you decided to get married. You're not willing to compromise with this person. Now imagine if you have a history of sacrifice with this person, just because some argument occurs in your marriage, that does not cause you to think of divorce. Brothers and sisters, 73% of women who get divorced and 60% of men who get divorced later severely regret their divorce and they believe it was a mistake. It was because of a petty, silly issue that caused them to file for a divorce. And then when they look back at it, when their perspectives change, they realize it wasn't worth it. What did I get myself into? Was it really worth it because of this silly issue? I ruined my family, the future of my children. 
When you have that shared history of sacrifice, when a wife remembers that when she was 20, her husband was young, he was 22, and he would go to school, he would work at the same time, he would come back exhausted, she appreciates those days. She's not going to say, now let me think of divorce, because she will always look back and remember all those tough days that they spent with each other. These tough days are healthy, brothers and sisters. They're extremely healthy. The same thing with the husband. When he looks back and he remembers that when he was, you know, a, a very, you know, a humble person. He didn't have much. He was struggling, yet his wife struggled with him. She was patient. He will appreciate such a wife. This is what we don't understand in our society. The Prophet, peace be upon him, encourages every Muslim to get married at a young age. Do not delay it, brothers and sisters. Don't listen to what society tells you. I ask you, is what society telling you, is the formula our society giving you a healthy formula? It's a formula that is resulting in 50% divorce rate. Because I know some of the youth, they'll come back and tell me, say it, you know, you have to be practical. What you're saying is not practical. We know theoretically it's good, but it's not practical. Do you have a better alternative? Yalla tfadlan, if you have a better alternative, I'll take it any time. We don't have a better alternative. The other alternative that we have is a 50% divorce rate. This is what our society teaches us. Sacrifice. Who says you have to live in a mansion when you get married? Live in a studio, in a one-bedroom apartment, that's fine. That's perfectly fine. Sacrifice with one another. When Allah sees that two Muslims, two individuals, they started small, so humble, they sacrificed with each other. You don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be generous with you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that He's generous with us. Never think about your financial situation. Leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't sustain myself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sustains me. As long as you're fulfilling your responsibility, have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brings us, you know, to the, to the last point that I want to discuss with you. And that is some of the conditions that we place, especially, you know, the family of, of, of the girl, of the, of the wife. They sometimes place unrealistic conditions on the man. Let's have mercy on us, brothers and sisters. Let's have mercy. You know, when it comes to the dowry or to your financial status, let's have some mercy. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, <laughs> The best women of my ummah, of my nation, are those with the lowest dowry. I'm not saying this. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, is saying this. In another hadith, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, says, The Prophet says, It is unfortunate that I, if someone who has the appropriate qualities, I turn him away just because of the financial situation. The Prophet says, This is, you know, uh, unfortunate for you. This is miserable for you if you do something like that. If you know someone who has the appropriate qualities, don't think about their financial situation. Leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is this that is destroying our marriages. Who cares how much he has in his bank account? Let him have $500. If he has $50,000, a million dollars, do you think that will buy happiness for your daughter? Do you think that will buy happiness for you? You know, I've heard many families, when they talk about the dowry, they want a big dowry. So they tell the other family, you know, you think our daughter's cheap, we're going to give her, you know, for a cheap value? Unfortunately, many, especially in the Middle East, they have this ideology. You know what I tell these families? I tell them, let's say the dowry is $100 million. Are you selling your daughter? Is that the value? Is that the value? What do you mean you don't want to give your daughter for a cheap price? Is this buying and selling? Unfortunately, many, many, you know, uh, uh, of, of, of people of, that we have in our society, many of our parents, they have this mentality. This is an incorrect mentality. You're not selling your daughter. The dowry is not a value, a price tag that's being put on your daughter. Your daughter has no price. She's priceless. Even if you put $100 million, 
You've done injustice to your daughter because that's not her true value. The dowry is something symbolic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mandatory. The dowry of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, the greatest woman in the history of the universe. The greatest woman, okay? What was her dowry? 500 dirhams. That's probably $2,000 if you want to count it today. Probably even less, $1,000. Do you think the Prophet gave his daughter for a cheap price? Well, I add to That's not how we should look at this. This is not a financial transaction. The Prophet, peace be upon him, is teaching us that if you want tawfiq, you want the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to be amongst the best women of his ummah, then that should be the last thing you worry about. The issue of, you know, the financial status. Is this person a businessman? Does he have the money? Leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I know some of you are concerned, well, you know, I want to secure the future of my daughter. I mean, I don't want to give her to someone who has nothing. Brothers and sisters, if you found the appropriate person, if you're giving your daughter to someone who has good akhlaq, good character, a person who fears God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't go wrong. This person will make your daughter happy. He will give her happiness. So there's nothing to worry about. Yes, if you've given your daughter to the wrong person, you have everything to worry about. Even if this person, you know, is a millionaire, you still have a lot to worry about. But the problem is that we pay attention to what's not important. That's what the problem we have in society. This is the advice of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Let's take this advice from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the success in choosing the appropriate person, especially the parents. And by the way, one last advice I'll give you is that if you, you know, know someone who has the good qualities and your parents, you know, for invalid reasons, they don't want this person either because he's not rich or because, you know, he doesn't come from this specific place, drive your parents crazy. Yes. This is the only time that I'll give advice to the youth to drive their parents crazy. We respect our parents. But if someone who has come with the right qualities, they've approached you and he's being turned down for a silly reason, an un-Islamic reason, drive your parents crazy. In a gentle way, drive them crazy. Put pressure on them. And for you brothers and sisters who are young, and your parents you know, want you to finish your college and get a work and, you know, uh, be 25, 30, 35 for you to get married. This is what you do tonight, inshallah. Go to them and tell your mother. Tell her, look, I respect you. First of all, kiss her hands. <laughs> tell her, listen, I'm at the age of marriage right now. And Allah, the Quran, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, are instructing me as a Muslim to get married at an earlier age. So make this deal with her. Tell her, look. I give you six months. Either you work with me so we can find the appropriate person. Because you want to find someone who your parents are, of course, pleased with. Don't go, don't go against the wishes of your parents. Tell them, look, for, you know, let's, let's work together. Let's find someone whom I'm comfortable with and you're comfortable with. Otherwise, I give you a deadline, six months. If you don't help me in these six months, I will go and find my own person. And then we'll have issues. Put a deadline, you know, be realistic with them. Most parents, they don't know what we're going through. They don't have a grasp of our society. So be realistic with them. You know, they say one day a man was looking for a wife. So his friend asks him after a few months, he tells him, so did you find someone? He says, well, I found someone, but my mother didn't accept. He says, why? He says, well, she, didn't, she wants certain qualities. After a while, he sees him again. He tells him, now did you find someone? He says, no, everyone whom I find, my mother, you know, is not comfortable with. She says, you know, she has this issue, this quality, this quality. So he tells him, what does your mother want? He says, well, my mother wants someone like her who has her qualities. He says, okay, so go find someone who has the qualities of your mother. After a couple of months, he sees him. He tells him, so did you find the right person? He says, I found an exact copy of my mother. A girl who has all the qualities of my mother. He tells him, so why didn't it work out? What's the problem? He says, well, this time, 
My dad told me, look, I can't stand your mother. You bring someone exactly like her to our house? No way. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to truly give us the tawfiq in thinking about what is right, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi tayyibin al-tahirin. Wow. Wow.